Peter Jackson's adaptation of Lord of the Rings is probably one of the greatest cinematic trilogies of all time, and to date probably the best fantasy series of all time as well. And like any good fantasy, it comes with a great number of spectacular beasts, here wonderfully brought to life by the Weta Workshops. In this video we'll be focusing on the two main species that hounded Tolkien's assorted heroes, across Middle-earth, the Wargs and the Fell Beasts. We'll speculate on their behaviour, origins and role within and prior to the Third Age and the War of the Ring, using studies from our own natural world. So let's begin. To start with the wargs, probably the most glaring question anyone can have is why are those in The Hobbit different to those in The Two Towers and The Return of the King? The doylist answer is that The Hobbit had almost a different director and the returning ones still wanted a different design anyway. But that's boring. So for a Watsonian answer, let's consider what such reasons could be in the world of Middle-earth. Considering the origins of the two types of warg, I imagine much like his orcs, Saruman got his wargs from Sauron. We later see the same type used as mounts for orc officers in Return of the King. Sauron and the other forces of darkness in the series aren't above a spot of biological tampering. As we'll discuss later, that's also how Sauron got his fell beasts as well. And in the films, it's made pretty clear that the Orokai are specifically bred to be a cut above an average orc. Wargs also do seem to exhibit some unnatural recklessness, sometimes seen in domestic dogs, often seemingly keen to attack even when downed and plunging over cliffs with reckless abandon. Overall, it seems reasonable that Sauron's wargs are effectively domesticated ones, selectively bred for aggression in combat. There's also some evidence to suggest this in their skulls as well. In both turning wolves into dogs and the famous project of creating domesticated silver foxes, canid skulls often shorten and sometimes broaden over the process of domestication. We never get a good look at warg skulls, or any look for that matter. But from their heads we can see that Sauron's wargs do indeed seem to have shorter, blunted snouts than those of the Hobbit. This is also seen in other carnivores too, so even if wargs aren't canids it can still apply. Other features of domestication include floppy ears and shorter tails. Wargs do seem to have shorter tails, but I'm not sure you could call the ears floppy in comparison to the hobbit wargs, but they do seem smaller. The measurement of the bones of the limb also differ between dogs and wolves, and this may lead to Sauron's wargs being slower too, hence Gandalf's fear of the wild Gundabad wargs potentially catching Radagast. So the hobbit wargs may be wild but tamed animals, whereas Sauron's wargs in the Ring series have been domesticated for his war in his duration in Mordor. A quick reminder for anyone who's foggy on the difference, tameness is just a wild animal that's used to people. Domestication is a specific process that physically and behaviourally changes an animal through selective breeding, at the hands of man, or Maya in this case. Another and slightly simpler reason could also be that they're just different species or even subspecies. Whilst referred to as Gundabad wargs, Gundabad is just the goblin capital in the Misty Mountains where the wild wargs are endemic anyway. It seems unlikely that they're different to others in that mountain range. Sauron's wargs could be from a part of Middle-earth not really seen in the films, in the game Lord of the Rings Conquest, the Haradrim had a warg with faint stripes and a very mohawk-like mane, quite similar to that of a striped hyena. Maybe Sauron's wargs initially came from Harad as well, or maybe the lands between Mordor and the east. On this note, whilst Tolkien envisioned his wargs as effectively giant evil wolves, often referring to them as such, Jackson's Hobbit and Ring wargs are noticeably different even if the Hobbit wargs are significantly wolfier. But if they're not canids, what may they have been? When we look at prehistoric dogs and hyenas, they rank pretty low in the totem pole when it comes to overall size. Episcion Haydini, the largest dog ever, only got to the size of somewhere between a lioness and a bear. Pachycrocuta, the largest hyena ever, is not much better. For a time it was believed, and for the most part it still is, that the bigger you get, the more your limbs need to adapt for the extra stress, and those same adaptations make you slower that in turn make it more difficult to hunt fast herbivores. Hence why giant prehistoric carnivores seemed most likely to rely on ambush over running their prey down. A caveat exists in the giant short-faced bear Arctodus, though, who despite being one of the largest carnivores ever, seems to have been adapted for fast running. So maybe a horse-sized carnivore that can move at decent speeds isn't so far-fetched. But Arctodus could still supinate its forelimbs like most other bears, and wargs we see can't. Is there another giant prehistoric carnivore they could be? No, there's actually two candidates. One are creodonts. All of our modern carnivorous mammals like dogs, cats and bears are in one neat order, the carnivora. Several tens of millions of years ago, there was another order of now completely extinct meat-eating mammals, 
the Creodonta. If you know them from anywhere, it's likely from walking with beasts Hyenodon. Hyenodon Gigas is itself a pretty worthy notion for a warg. Its body mass estimates are pretty large, and when you look at some Creodont skulls, the rectangular shape and lack of pronounced snout do seem to match quite well with Sauron's wargs. There's also Sarcastodon, believed to be one of the largest carnivorous mammals, so it definitely has the size component. Another candidate is Amphision, an extinct member of the Carnivora. Known informally as bear dogs, they also grew quite massive and were purely carnivorous. They may have used pursuit predation over ambush as well. Tolkien refers to the fell beasts as beasts remaining from a prior geological era of Middle-earth, which is kind of odd as Middle-earth had three ages and seems to have been in existence not that long. But who knows, maybe like them, the wargs or their ancestors have a distant and wild past. And despite superficially resembling wolves, they're ultimately something more ancient. Again, I should remind anyone new that my videos aren't canon but speculation. I don't really think Tolkien ever considered Creodonts or Amphision in the creation of his wargs, it's just a bit of fun. Wargs chiefly seem to be pack hunters, so let's have a look at some of our own world's pack hunters and see which may be most comparable to wargs. The natural first comparison is obviously to compare them to wolves, but interestingly Azog's large white warg is in fact a female described in the various art books as the matriarch, and the mother of most of the pack. Perhaps the most well-known matriarchal social carnivore in our own world is the spotted hyena, but new findings show people may have got it backwards on why the females are in charge. Most hyenas in a clan are related, even if distantly, so to prevent inbreeding and to get better mating opportunities, the males typically disperse. In hyena society, when you enter a new clan you start at rock bottom and have to slowly work your way up. So even the lowest ranking resident female will still outrank these new immigrant males. It actually has nothing to do with birth in that respect. A hyena cub of either gender automatically inherits its mother's rank. It's just that the males sacrifice this privilege when they leave home. The native females also garner social support so they can win skirmishes within their own clan irrespective of size or age. And the higher your rank, the more support you have. In hyena society, rank really is everything. It means better access to kills, more dominance and stronger support. Everything to make your life easier. So it's not that females are naturally bigger and thus dominate males, as was once thought, but females will likely be higher ranked due to not needing to disperse, and will get this steamrolling series of benefits from that. This in turn leads to them being healthier, more dominant, and thus larger from these benefits. Spotted hyena society is complex, and wag society we don't really know that much about. The fact most of the pack does seem to be adults seems to suggest that adults don't disperse quite as readily as hyenas and the matriarch's dominance seems to be singular, rather than because she's supported by other adults. Most canid societies are often a nuclear family, of parents and their adult offspring of varying ages, and so the term alpha is a bit outdated. Breeder would be more appropriate, as the dominant individuals are often just the parents. It seems the canid wag society may most resemble is actually the African wild dog, or painted wolf. In their packs, the breeding female is also the most important member, but the breeding male is actually quite an unimportant position. Wild dog litters often have multiple paternities, and the breeding male's dominance may only last for a single season before he's displaced. In short, the males aren't hugely important. It's the females who are the long-term dominants. They also lead hunts, and will have the most experience both in hunting and utilising their territory. They're also potentially more aggressive. Whilst they're often referred to as alphas or breeders, it's pretty fair to call the dominant female of a wild dog pack its matriarch, and as such I believe they're the best fit to compare wargs to as well. Azog's pack is likely the white matriarch, a few unrelated males, and then their offspring. There are a handful of non-mounted wargs that are seemingly the first ones sent off to scout or chase the dwarves and these are likely the youngest pups in the group who, like wild dog pups, will chase anything. Only when it's a serious hunt in order do the adults properly get involved. For the final part of the wag section of this video, I was keen to see how efficient wags would be as mounts. Brett Devereaux, I really hope I said that right, in his excellent series of analysing fictitious warfare, sadly left out some of the more fantasy aspects, and I was quite intrigued to have a look at this myself. So let's start by asking how much a warg eats, and then applying the various scenarios of their use. First, we need to know how much a warg weighs, and the Lord of the Rings film series companion law and art book suggested 400 pounds, which is about the same as a male lion and is ridiculously low. A decent sized male polar bear is around double that, and wargs are still probably a bit more, likely in line with a good sized horse. 
I'd say something like 900 to 1,000 pounds, or between 450 and 500 kilograms, roughly. One paper calculating the energy requirements of various carnivores shows this requires roughly 100,000 kilojoules per day, which in turn translates roughly into 10 kilograms of large vertebrate prey per day. Assuming a wag would eat its prey in entirety, and if we roughly average male and female body masses of their prey, we can quickly calculate a few rough estimates as to how much a single wag and a good sized pack would eat. The average working peasant of Rohan would probably last a wag 6 days, a good war horse would last 60 days, a pig or boar 8 days, and a decent elk 35 days. Whilst this of course assumes that the meat doesn't decay, but this came out a lot cheaper than I was expecting. In short, one wog could eat its fill pretty well from just about any nearby farm or forest it was raiding. But what about a pack? If we roughly assume 35 wogs for the group that attacked the Rohirrim or Azog's initial pack, then they'd require 6 peasants per day, just over half a warhorse per day, 5 pigs or 1 elk per day. Of course, carnivores normally prefer to eat a huge amount in one sitting and then just sleep it off for the next few days, but that's not really conducive to raiding and pillaging. But still, overall wags are a lot cheaper than I thought. But finally, how about a year? For a pack, that would be 2,190 peasants, 182 war horses, 1,852 pigs, or 365 elk. When you get into the big numbers over long periods of time, that's actually quite a lot. Clearly, wags or any large carnivore would be very expensive to keep, and only realistically used by the largest and wealthiest of empires with either a lot of arable land or no concern for the environment. It's mentioned in the books Mordor did actually buy horses from Rohan so maybe they were winding up as dog food. For Saruman though, it's pretty clear he didn't care about the ancient forest of Fangorn. As he chopped it down, he likely emptied it of its native large herbivores to keep his pack fed until it was time to strike against Rohan. In fact, maybe the reason his Uruks didn't get anything but maggoty bread for three stinking days is because Saruman needed all the meat foraged for his wags, as to keep a pack that size captive is pretty expensive. As for tactics, wags seem pretty well suited for a type of warfare known as chevauché. Again, I really hope I said that right. A mounted group of cavalry stormed the local settlements like villages, raiding and killing and retreating before a defence can be mounted. This takes their resources, kills able-bodied people who could be recruited, and demoralises the enemy. Wags can travel long distances swiftly and are powerful killers, and you wouldn't have to worry too much about their supplies as they can just eat the villagers and their livestock after a raid. This is pretty useful to get done early, as defeating the forces of men when they're holed up in Helm's Deep or Minas Tirith is pretty difficult, but if you can bleed their forces early by eating the bulk of the able-bodied peasantry, you may be able to make your life a lot easier for yourself later. If they dispatch a small cavalry force to respond, all the better as wargs can quite easily take down any warhorse. And again, it's less to deal with later in a costly siege. If you want to keep things quiet and pillage as much as you can without detection, wogs are also ideal. Like sniffer dogs, they can track down any escapees and eat them, to make sure your tracks are covered for as long as possible. This also makes them very useful for recon in general too. For the discerning evil lord keen on bleeding out his enemy before launching into full warfare, wargs or warg-like beasts seem like a good choice. Probably the real downside of wargs in warfare, other than cost, is that they're not especially useful in a siege, like any cavalry really. Whilst they can be used like horses for officers, and they can be of some use in storming castles and finding prisoners once the walls are breached, in Return of the King this happens very quickly. It's more typical for a siege to last for weeks or months. Finding enough meat when you're stationary in one area will be difficult for that amount of time. Now it's time for the other of the fantastic beasts I wanted to talk about, the Fell Beast. First appearing in the films Over the Dead Marshes in search of Frodo, Sam and Gollum, the draconic Fell Beasts were the mounts of the Nine Nazgul, after Arwen washed their horses away at the Ford of Bruinen. But can something that big fly? And if a warg is pretty costly, how much is it to feed a Fell Beast? And what exactly do they eat? To start off with flight, yes and no as to whether a Fell Beast could fly. A lot of winged monsters in media could probably fly or at least glide if you flung them out of the back of a Hercules, but flight is also takeoff and landing. You need to be able to get to a position in the air column where you can glide before you exhaust your energy reserves, and that's where a lot of winged beasts would fall short. Fell beasts might fall short here too as well. When we look at this excellent size scale of Other's Darkhead Pterosaurs by Mark Witten, that I did an awful job of squeezing a fell beast into, we can see it's not really that outlandish for such a big animal to fly. 
The issue more comes from the proportions. The fell beast has a thick neck, a large gut, and quite chunky hind limbs. All of these add weight, but even if the bones are very light, like pterosaurs and birds, you can't really save on weight in the same way with muscle, as darkids had pretty small hind limbs and use their enormous front limbs and flight muscles to take off, meaning they don't need muscular, bird-like hind legs, and thus can get to a much larger body size. But with all that said, the fell beast is still one of the much better attempts at a giant flyer in fiction. When we look at its wings, they're very long and quite thin. This would give it a relatively low wing loading, which is what we'd expect to see in a giant saurer. Wing loading is the flyer's weight divided by the area of its wing. Smaller, agile forest birds tend to have quite high wing loading and are very agile flyers. The larger and heavier you get, the lower your wing loading is, and thus the larger wings you need. Much like movement on land, size in flight decreases mobility, dexterity, and the agility of its flyers. Whilst it may decrease speed in relative terms, the huge size would still allow for very fast aerial movement, and it's been suggested that giant pterosaurs could reach speeds of 100 km per hour and maybe more. A fell beast would likely be the same, and there would be no faster transport in Middle Earth. Indeed, in their book description they are said to be outrunning the wind. On flying, the fell beast also flies very nicely as well. When watching in the films, they fly with quite shallow wing beats and relatively stiff wings, and this is what we'd expect to see for an animal with such wing shape and loading. The bigger you are, the less you need to flap, and again this is done quite well with slow, spaced wing beats. But fell beasts may not have always been too big to fly, as they were never that large to begin with. It's said in the books fell beasts were a rare and wild species, taken by Sauron and nursed to become larger than any other flying creature at the time. So as referenced earlier, we know Sauron isn't above a bit of bioengineering. It's unknown if he selectively bred fell beasts for this, or if he only started with one group and then fed them dark magical growth enhancers. Tolkien suggests that they may have come from a prior geological era of Middle-earth, with its three ages, and that it may be fell beasts, or at least the initial creatures they came from, that were akin to Middle-earth's pterosaurs. The original books do describe them as beaked, after all. But be it beak or jaw, what exactly does a fell beast eat? Tolkien never says, but at one point Frodo compares them to carrion birds, and the book uses the word vulture form to describe them too. The art and lore book of the films flat out describes them as scavengers too, so it seems quite reasonable, indeed, that the fell beasts, wherever possible, prefer to take dead meat. Using the maquettes produced by the wet at workshop, we can see that the fell beasts have heterodont teeth, and sharp ones too. None of these really look adapted to crush, but it's probably not that important that they can't. Most smaller meals, like man, orc, and pigs, were probably just swallowed whole, and the larger things like mummerkill and those things here had bones too large to crush, and so they likely just used their long necks to reach inside the carcasses. The teeth are likely adapted to just grab and pull to rip carrion from the carcass. Giant scavengers on the wing are quite well represented in nature as well. As well as our own vultures and condors, there was Argentavis one of the largest birds ever to fly and perhaps second only to Pelagornis. This was effectively a vulture or condor that stood as tall as a man. Among the pterosaurs, in the early days of Quetzalcoatl, some suggested it was effectively the giant reptilian vulture of the Cretaceous. This view never really took off in the science community, but a good number of paleoartists really ran with it, and made the pterosaur some demonic death monster. But there is one pterosaur that seems likely to have been a scavenger though. It's the Odactylus. It has the skull to suggest it had a reasonably strong bite, with good adaptations to pull, but no real adaptations to hold struggling prey. So it seems the Cretaceous did have a reptilian vulture, but it was just a lot smaller than first thought, with a wingspan of only 4 meters. The notion of large soaring scavengers is one that fits well with biological modeling too, as one paper finds that the most likely and efficient scavenger will be one that flies. The saved costs of transport, with gliding and large areas searched, make it the most efficient way of finding carrion and the large size of a fell beast would likely allow it to intimidate other carnivores off a kill. As for the costs of feeding, it might not be much more than a warg. It's been suggested giant theropods may have metabolic rates similar to those suggested for a wanton mammalian carnivore. And whilst I'm a little bit sceptical they were quite that low overall, a fell beast would probably be relatively cheap for its size. What exactly Sauron fed them in Mordor is unknown, other than fell meats. But once he was finished with prisoners or disloyal orcs, they may have been donated to the Nazgul for their mounts. In terms of using a fell beast, they are absolutely unparalleled for recon. Their sharp eyes and their huge speeds they travel at mean they can search massive areas at once, and this gives them a myriad of uses. Scanning for enemies, plotting attacks, or overseeing an active battle. They would be well worth their weight in meat. They can also be used defensively. 
Whilst in the books they were purely to try and find the ring, it's not the fell beast that kills Theoden, but the witch king killing his horse with a dart, and one is shot down by Legolas with a single arrow near the end of the first book. As a result, the other Nazgul are pretty cautious of getting too close when they come to reduce morale in the Siege of Gondor. But in the films, they're used a lot more in combat, against both men and horses to great effect, and are instrumental in weakening the defences of Minas Tirith against Sauron's siege. They're also a lot more resilient, with one tanking an arrow to the chest from Faramir, and providing resistance to the eagles at the Black Gate as well. In the lore and art book, it's also suggested that the Witch King had his fell beast armoured, especially as he wanted to take it into close quarter combat. I also just like the idea his soul had some ego left, and he wanted it to just resemble him as well. With the science done and onto just general thoughts, I feel like I'm one of the select few who didn't mind the hyena wargs in Two Towers. Yeah, more lupine wargs would have been more Tolkien, but as beasts, I still think they're pretty cool. Their design team at Weta also weren't happy but an interesting conundrum they faced with the Hobbit Wargs was making the wolf-like ones too beautiful or likeable looking. They still had to appear like a force of evil, so they went with a mix of dog and lion in the end. In the books, there is no mounted warg attack in the Two Towers. Instead, there's a chapter before Moria where a wild pack attack the Fellowship before being seen off with magic and arrows, and that's pretty much it. In The Hobbit, the wargs are also wild, and noticeably have their own language and leader, a great grey warg who was likely translated into the White Matriarch for the films. They align themselves with the goblins as equals rather than tamed mounts prior to the book. The fell beasts were described as beaked in the books, but with the pretty amazing illustrations of John Howe, everyone was suitably impressed and went with a non-beaked variant. And yeah, I do feel this looks better than any beaked illustration I've seen so far. They always just look a bit like badly done pterosaurs. So thanks for watching. If this is your first video from me and you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing, and sharing it with others who may be of the same mind. It'd really help. If there are other creatures or fictitious worlds you think might be good for this channel, please do suggest them too. Peter Jackson's Skull Island and Gendy Tartakovsky's Primal are two I plan to do at some point as well. Exploring speculative evolution through Primeval's Future Predator is another plan, and the Graboids are well suited to this type of video, and the Xenomorph is a pretty low hanging fruit to pick at some point too. I'm pretty pleased with how the last video was received as well. Bad Note Aquino brought up how Devil Joe doesn't eat his own tail in the New World, and oddly they refer to this in the art book, so maybe it was dropped last minute, as it's pretty hard to think of a behavioural reason why he wouldn't do this. Overaptor fan pointed out how sharks have their revolving door tooth mechanism, and this could be another explanation for Devil Joe's very weird mouth and dentistry. There's also the discussion of cladistics with Adrian Thompson, and this is something I've definitely steered away from on this channel, because cladistics is in my strong suit, and trying to determine them in Monster Hunter is a bit of a mess. As for the notion of dragon element, I may cover that at some point with another dragon element animal, it's just I still need to make my mind up on it, as I'm not entirely sure what it is. Thanks again for watching, I'll hopefully see you next time, and here's a reminder for the next monster to be covered. <laughs>